Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the virtual Peterson Institute for International Economics. It's my distinct pleasure and honor today to host my dear colleague, Olivier Jean Blanchard, for a discussion of his forthcoming book, Fiscal Policy Under Low Interest Rates. Um, Olivier is, of course, the C. Fred Bergston Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute, the inaugural holder of that chair. Uh, he is also, of course, the Robert M. Solo Professor of Economics Emeritus at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Today's discussion of fiscal policy under low interest rates is incredibly high stakes and quite contentious for good reason. Olivier has been a leading voice in a major rethinking of fiscal policy. Uh, this rethinking, not just in the title of his led macroeconomic conferences, he began really this rethinking publicly with his American Economic Association presidential address in January 2019, public debt and low interest rates. Uh, he has since then done successive refinements uh, and extensions of his basic analysis and tests of it. He has been subject, or rather his work, not him, has been subject to healthy scrutiny and criticism. And his work has arguably influenced the course of fiscal policy in the US, arguably in France, his native country, in the European Union, not as a blind mapping of the principles he's going to set out for us, but as a matter of practical policy. I would like to just contextualize further that, of course, Olivier was the chief economist at the IMF for seven years, including as director of the research department throughout the European and global financial crises. And during this period, he, I, and the lesser role and others were fighting against premature and excessive austerity in response to the global financial crisis. And I think that this argument that Olivier makes is important in that context, that we had many years, including years of great need, when fiscal policy response was insufficient. That being said, this is not just a swing back of the pendulum. This is a thoughtfully considered research project across many years, and it is fundamentally about how we think about debt sustainability, where Olivier, along with our former Peterson colleague, Jeremy Zettelmeyer, and many others have done creative work. And I think this analytical approach is at its core what the discussion has to be about. Whether there are limits to fiscal policy are not in question as Olivier himself has acknowledged. The question is where are those limits? How do we assess those limits? And how should policymakers adjust to those limits and take those limits into account? And that is where Olivier's forthcoming book fiscal policy under low interest rates is so important. Many of you have already seen the discussion hosted by MIT Press of the book in draft form. This is Olivier, meant to be Olivier's more general, broad statement of the book's argument. He is going to give us his views and then briefly after his presentation, I will ask him some questions, including ones from people who strongly disagree with his argument. So with that, let me turn it over to my dear colleague and friend, my teacher, Olivier Blanchard. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, as you've said, this is a work in progress. Uh, I'm still working on it and I'm still learning from it. Uh, but I thought uh, that writing the book and giving this talk was a good way of taking stock and seeing where I was and indeed engaging with the various uh, criticisms or discussions I've been, uh, I've been facing. So this is the title. As uh, Adam said, you can actually get uh, a draft of a pre-publication draft uh, of a book on an open site. MIT Press was extremely nice about it. Uh, it will actually be revised and they'll put the ultimate pre-publication uh, 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 draft on the net very soon. But you have the address at the bottom of the first page. Yeah, so let me just give uh, the basic argument. Uh, and the, the fact which has made me rethink what I thought about fiscal policy, say uh, 20, 20 years ago, is that there has been uh, a steady decrease 
in uh, what this is, uh, you know, a lot of adjectives, but a safe, real, neutral rates, well, a rates consistent with full employment. And these rates have clearly come down fairly steadily over the 35 years. You could think at the very beginning that it was just an accident, it just go away, but it's clear that it's a, it's a very deep, deep trend and we cannot ignore it. Now, this being said, and you know, this is clearly in the context of everybody thinking about the implications of uh, overheating and inflation in the US, there might well be bumps. Looking at the future, I fully expect the rates to go up uh, both the actual rates and the neutral rates to go up for a while because the economy is overheating and the Fed has to basically increase rates. Uh, but if I look beyond that, and I don't know what beyond means, probably a few years, then it seems to me that all the factors that I can identify behind the trend decline are still going to be there. So my view, and this is kind of the implicit assumption of the book, is that yes, we may have bumps, we may have higher neutral rates, even higher actual rates as the Fed needs to disinflate. But looking forward, we're probably going to be in an environment of very low, uh, safe, real, uh, neutral rates. And I think it has three implications, each of them very important for the way we think about fiscal policy. The first one is lower fiscal cost of deficits and debt, and that's nearly an arithmetic statement. I mean, if the interest rate is low, and uh, in fact, especially if it's lower than the growth rate, then the debt dynamics are much more attractive. You can run deficits and not run into debt explosions. That's arithmetic, that cannot be discussed or, or disagreed with, it's true. The, the second one is deeper. It is that the low rates come from somewhere. And in, in a way they come from a reflection that risk adjusted Capital may not be as productive as we think. Uh, low rate, I mean, if I said low marginal products, it would be obvious low rate is a bit different, but it's close. And so the implication of this is that debt, which crowds out capital, may not be so costly. So the lower welfare cost of deficits and debt, that's conceptually a different argument from the first one and a, a more a, a deeper and more complicated one to, to think about. Then the third one is really independent of these first two, it just uh, it comes from the zero lower bound. And when the real neutral rate is very low and inflation is very low, uh, which you know was the case and will be the case again, is my guess, then you get the constraint that monetary policy cannot decrease the nominal rate and by implication the real rate sufficiently. And therefore there's a need for more fiscal policy as a stabilization tool. So lower cost, higher potential benefits is basically, I think, the implication of these lower rates. So let me just finish this slide with the last line, which is that, you know, I've been asked to give this talk uh, in other countries, uh, emerging markets or even developing countries. And it's clear that it has to be translated very carefully. Uh, there are differences which are important. I think there are lessons, but this is really about fiscal policy in advanced economies, you know, the US, uh, the European Union. So let me start with two graphs, uh, which, which are going to be, I think, fairly familiar. The first one is what has happened to 10 year uh, real safe rates on the assumption that uh, the bonds I'm looking at, the sovereign bonds I'm looking at are basically risk-free over that period. And I choose to start not in 1985, as some do, but 1992. The reason is that from 1985 to 1992, what there is is basically the disinflation, the Volcker disinflation, which led to very high rates, but probably much above the neutral rates. So if I were to plot it from 1990, than this, but by 1992, inflation is under control. And so we can think of this to a first approximation as reflecting not the actual rates, but also the neutral rates. Uh, and as you can see, uh, steady trend, Japan started first, people look at Japan and said, poor people, what's happening to them? But very soon after, uh, it happened to the US, or not very soon, but a few decades later, it happened to the US. and. Uh, and, and, the, and the Eurozone. The other thing to say is that if I, you know, some people say, well, it's really the overhang of a global financial crisis, you'd be hard pressed, I think, from this graph to actually identify such an effect. It's clearly something 
which started long before and is still there. So it's not to say that the GFC or the COVID crisis haven't led to temporary lower rates. I think that's true of, of the COVID crisis, obviously. Uh, but the underlying trend is clearly due to different things than that. It's it's a trend. I mean, it's a, you know, it you, you look at it and, and and you have no doubt. I'm going to show you another graph, which I think has to be taken with a grain of salt, but I think the grain is, is you know, I think there's some wisdom there, which is that somebody called Schmelzing, who is at Harvard, has actually constructed a series of a safe wheel rate since 1325. So a fairly longer, much longer period than I've looked at. How does he do it? Well, he starts with uh, loans uh, in Venice in the, in the early 14th century. He argues that to a first approximation, the loans he's looking at uh, were safe. You can discuss it, but I think in general, the, the message is a very clear one, which is that for clearly fundamental reasons of these uh, whatever it is, uh, seven centuries, uh, the safe real rate has steadily decreased. And I think it tells us, yes, it has decreased much faster over the last 30 years, but there is something about the world which basically says it tends to go down over time, maybe increasing income, decreasing uncertainty, a better financial system. Uh, I find this graph quite, quite fascinating. So let me move and discuss uh, how I think about this decrease in rates. So there are basically two ways of defining the, the neutral rate or the real safe neutral rate, I'll just say, neutral rate. Uh, the first one, and, and you see both in the literature and they're equivalent, but I think they lead you to think in slightly different ways. You can think basically of world saving and world investment, and that's the rate at which uh, the two are equal when output is equal to potential. Um, or you can think, if you think that financial markets are not well integrated, you may want to think of domestic saving, domestic investment. That's the first way. The second, which is more Keynesian in spirit, but again, is uh, identical in terms, I mean, you can go from one to the other, is that this is the rate at which aggregate demand uh, generate enough demand so that output is at potential output. So the rate consistent. Uh, with full employment, if you want to say it this way. So if, for example, there is a large fiscal expansion, then the second way of thinking about it tells you, yes, there's going to be more aggregate demand, a high neutral rate. Now, what I've argued is that what we've seen over the last 30 years is mostly a decrease in the neutral rate. Sometimes the real rate can be a different from the neutral rate, can be below, can be above. For example, on the disinflation, you'll have to get the real rate higher than the neutral rate, which is a current discussion about monetary policy. Uh, and conceptually, uh, it can come from two sources because we're talking about the real safe rate. The first one is that there has been a decrease in the marginal product of capital over time, uh, which may come from the fact that there's a lot of saving and investment demand is weak, and therefore the marginal product, the last addition to capital, is not very productive. In this case, you'd basically see all the rates come down, uh, not, not, not all the rates uh, given the, the risk premium associated with them, but, but they will all come down. The second is different which is maybe there hasn't been a decrease in the marginal product of capital, but the risk aversion has increased or there has been an increase for the demand, or in the demand for safe assets where no, capital is risky. So a decrease in the safe rate given the marginal product of capital. So this points to factors like an increased demand for safe assets, more demand for liquidity, more market risk aversion. And these two factors, I argue, uh, have, been, have been at play. And in the book, I go into much more detail about this. So if you look at the evidence, there's a very large number of papers, many of them very good, but it is clearly a very difficult issue, uh, many potential suspects. And I don't think that we know exactly what the combination of factors behind what has happened is. Um, my sense, again, is that if I were to summarize, uh, I think both of the potential sources uh, are, are at work. The first one is, is saving. Uh, 
I think demographics, which is the increase in longevity, which dominates demographics, uh, leads people to save more because they are going to be retired longer. Uh, that has played a role. I think the general increase in income uh, actually tends to uh, increase saving. And clearly poor individuals do not save and they start saving when they get richer. Same thing with poor countries. When countries are poor, uh, they save little and then they save more as they become richer. I think that, you know, if you look at the graph on, uh, uh, on, on the rate since 1325, I think that that's a dominant factor. So I think these factors have been at play. The others may have played a a wall, but minor relative to that. And then the second is, yes, I think the equity premium has increased, namely for a given return on stocks or expected return on stocks. People are willing to hold safe assets at a lower rate. Uh, the safety discount uh, has also uh, increased. Uh, why is this? It's much less clear. I think regulation, which has forced many financial institutions to hold more safe assets, they don't use the word safe, they use the word liquid, but it's very close. Uh, probably has played a role, maybe more. I'm not sure we fully understand it, but I think these two factors have been at work. So why do I have to go through that? Because you know, if my take is going to be, well, that's going to be uh, relevant for the future, I have to argue that these factors are going to continue uh, to be at play. When I go through each of these factors, I see no particular reason why they should reverse. Uh, there was a discussion of demographics. Uh, I'm absolutely convinced that demographics will continue to play the same role. We're going to live longer and longer, and each age, age of retirement is not going to increase in uh, one for one. Uh, that's going to lead to more savings. So I can go through the various ones, but it seems to me that there's no reason to anticipate uh, a major change. With two caveats, and I think these are important ones. I mean, I could be proven wrong and my book might be a history book rather than, than something more ambitious. The first one is we care about global warming. It's going to be expensive. Um, so you can think of a green investment boom, which is an increase uh, in investment, which would increase the neutral rate. And I think if we did it on the right scale, this might actually happen. Uh, this would increase uh, the uh, equilibrium neutral rate. The other is, expansionary fiscal policy. And, you know, we have an example of it now, which is that fiscal policy has been extremely expansionary uh, uh, last year uh, and the year before, and is leading to overheating and the need to increase the rate. The neutral rate is clearly higher than, than it would otherwise be. So in the short run, we may well have this bump, which I talked about in the introduction, but it could be uh, more sustained. I mean, if we have large deficits, a large sustained fiscal expansion, then we may have a higher rate in the future. Uh, it would be fine with me. That's one of the reasons why uh, the rate might actually be higher. But this would be the result of actually adapting fiscal policy to this environment. So, Let me get from there with one more slide to fiscal policy. So let's call the R the safe real rate and R star <clears throat> the neutral rate. As, as R has come down, which was the first of the two graphs, uh, but it has caused two thresholds. The first one is R has become less than G and R minus G has become kind of a standard expression in the discussions among economists, R minus G has become negative, which happened in the past for different reasons, but here uh, really reflects a decrease in the neutral rate relative to, uh, to the growth rate. Uh, at this stage, despite the fact that rates have increased, basically the R minus G is roughly minus 2%. Uh, you can think of a nominal rate and the nominal growth rate. The nominal rate at 10 years is about 2.5, uh, which is much higher than a few weeks ago. Uh, and G is probably around 2. So R, is, R minus G is minus 2%. Um, that has very strong fiscal implications. That dynamics are very different when R minus G is negative. And it has, as I said earlier, very clear but more complex welfare implications. It says the welfare cost of debt is lower. There's a second threshold, which is much lower, but which has been crossed uh, fairly frequently over the last uh, 10, 
15 years, which is the one where the zero lower bound or what we now call the effective lower bound because we can go with a bit negative with a negative, uh, with a nominal rate, um, prevents monetary policy from achieving what would be needed, which is a large negative neutral rate. Uh, so when basically the nominal rate is down to zero and inflation is expected inflation says 2%, then monetary policy cannot achieve a real rate, real neutral rate of less than minus 2%. Sometimes a much lower rate is needed, it can't do it. So sometimes it has been strictly binding and it's still binding in some countries. Even if you're not exactly at the zero lower bound, it's clear that the room for monetary policy to sustain output is very limited in a world in which we're very close to the zero lower bound, which we clearly are uh, in, the, in the US at this point. Uh, the problem at this stage in the US is not underheating, but overheating. But many countries or most countries are now still very close to the zero lower bound, in which case something else has to be used to maintain demand and maintain output has to be fiscal policy. So yeah, this is a picture which basically shows what has happened to R minus G. And you can see that at the beginning of a sample, uh, the two are, are very close and they have become uh, 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 more and more separate. The gap has become wider. It stops in 2021. Uh, as we know, uh, the red line now has increased quite a bit. It's closer to, to zero for the 10 year uh, real rate. But again, this is reflecting the current situation. I think the gap is going to be there for a long time. Good. So let me now take the, the three issues which I talked about the fiscal cost of debt, the welfare cost of debt, and uh, the benefits of deficits when we're close to the zero lower bound. So, I mean, the, the discussion is, as you know, and, and at this stage it's a bit quiet, but it's going to come back, which is levels of debt. Interest rates are very low, but debt levels are very high. So on one side, you have Mr. Schauble in Germany saying we really have to decrease that now. And then you have Paul Krugman on the other side saying, no, it's fine. You can use that. There's no problem. So for, to discuss this, you need, you know, basic algebra. And so the, you have to go to the basic dynamics of the debt to GDP ratio. So let me just spend two minutes on this. So D is the debt to GDP ratio. So D minus one is the ratio last period, say last year. R is the real rate, G is the real growth rate, and S is the primary balance or primary surplus. So this is the equation. It basically says that if we have a zero primary balance, so S is equal to zero, then the debt ratio will move according to the ratio of one plus R to one plus G. If R is less than G, then debt will naturally tend to decrease. The debt ratio will naturally tend to decrease. In the traditional case, if R is greater than G, then that will tend to increase. Uh, and so that's the first reason why that might move. And then the second one is S is not equal to zero in general. Now, what we surely want at a minimum is, uh, unless there are special events, is basically stabilization of the debt to GDP ratio. So we want D to be equal to D minus one. And so this gives us the equation for the primary balance, which is needed to achieve that. And if you do the algebra, you'll see that it's equal to R minus G divided by one plus G times D. So in the traditional case, I mean, the kind of textbook case, which I still have very much in my own textbook, R minus G is positive. And so the conclusion is, yes, you can have that, but you're going to need primary surpluses in the future because R minus G is positive. And the larger the debt, the larger the primary surplus, and it's going to be hard. You're going to have to increase taxes. Or, or decrease spending. Uh, but you can see that when R minus G is negative, then you can actually run a primary deficit as can be negative, and still that uh, the debt ratio will be stabilized. And that's clearly the context in which, in which we are. So there are three ways of stating the implication of uh, R minus G negative. The first one, which I think is the right one, uh, is that you can run a primary deficit and keep the debt ratio constant. So if, for example, uh, 
that is 100% of GDP, R minus G is minus 2%, and you can run the primary deficit of 2%. You're in, you're out, and that will not explode as a ratio to GDP. So you can run primary deficits. You shouldn't be as worried. Now, there are two ways of stating this, which are stronger, but I think a bit provocative and probably a bit misleading. The first is, well, suppose you run a primary deficit of more than 2% in my case, but what will, impact, what will happen is that that will increase, but it will not explode. And basically when R minus G is negative, that cannot explode. It can increase to a new level, but it doesn't explode. So I take the example here for primary deficit of 3% rather than 2%, uh, R minus G minus 2%, so I have a typo again, then that will increase to 150%, but it will basically stabilize there. So there's a sense you could say, well, you can run larger primary deficits, you'll have more debt, but no debt explosion. Uh, the third way of saying it is, I think, even more provocative, which is, suppose that I want to run a deficit for a year, so I issue debt, and I never raise taxes to pay for it then why the implication of this equation is that you'll go back over time without raising taxes, you'll go back over time to the same debt ratio as you had before, uh, which looks like, you know, uh, immaculate financing. You can basically issue uh, debt and not have to raise taxes. So I have at some point, I must admit, kind of push this, this third line maybe too much. I think the right way to think about it is the first. But even why, why is it that, you know, the last two are, are potentially misleading? Two reasons, I think one more important than the other. The first one is on the geneity, which is when you start doing this, uh, then you're going to have a more uh, expansionary fiscal policy that's going to lead to a higher neutral rate, a higher R star, therefore a higher R, and the dynamics are not going to be as attractive. Eventually, R, will, R minus G will change sign, and then you'll be in the old case again. So there's a limit to what you can do. The second is uncertainty, which is that, you know, even if I convince you that R is going to remain low, we can't quite be sure. And so there's a chance that in the future, R, the underlying R, the neutral rate, uh, will actually be higher than G and then the old dynamics will come into play. So you have to be careful about, about both. So in that context, this has led me to work because it is a very hot issue uh, in the European Union on debt sustainability. Now I think that assessment should be done kind of no matter what happens to R, but in the context of a low R, it becomes obvious that uh, we have to think about it again. So let me spend one slide on, on that sustainability. And that sustainability is a probabilistic, probabilistic statement. Okay. There is no way in which that is absolutely safe without any question. The question is, is the probability very small? Uh, the uncertainty comes from everywhere. It comes from the primary balance. Maybe there'll be a war and you'll have to spend more or a COVID crisis. Uh, it comes from growth. Are we sure that potential growth will remain what it is or could it just be much less? It will come from changes in the interest rate. And so what I've argued is, and I think that applies to the US as well as to uh, Europe, is that the right tool is basically to do what, you know, this has an ugly name, uh, stochastic debt sustainability analysis, SDSA as it's known. It's basically doing, exploring paths, taking into account the uncertainty and getting a distribution of debt or debt changes, debt ratio changes, uh, five years out, 10 years out, taking into account all the elements which you have to take in, into account, including the uncertainty. I think they can be done. I think it can be very useful. Sometimes it tells you, well, five years from now, you know, there is really a part of the distribution of debt, which looks dangerous. You should probably do something about it, or it tells you things are fine. Now, I found that the kind of approach doesn't satisfy you know, policymakers in Brussels. They want rules. They have rules, they are bad. Uh, they are looking for new rules. And I just want to put on the, uh, in the discussion where I, if there has to be a rule, uh, what should it basically look like? And what I want to argue, what I've argued is that instead of looking at debt or the debt ratio, as is traditional, you know, with 60% numbers, 90% numbers, uh, you should look at the debt service ratio. And the reason is very clear. 
Now, if you go back to the equation here, forget the one plus d, which really plays no role. Basically, this is what you'll have to finance. And so you want to make sure that you can generate a primary surplus, a uh, primary balance, which is such that you can cover that. You can cover the debt surplus. So basically what you should be focusing on is R minus G times D. And clearly when R minus G is negative, that looks rather good. It looks like you have much more room than just looking at D. This being said, there's a, an enormous caveat, which is that D moves slowly. R minus G times D can move very fast. But if R minus G increases by 1% or 2%, that's a very big change in debt service. So what you want to do is take into account not only the debt service ratio, but the uncertainty about it. Uh, and the uncertainty is going to be magnified the bigger is D. R minus G, if D is very small, doesn't much matter. Movements in R minus G don't matter much, but if D is very large, uh, you can have very large changes in that service and you have to be ready. So what I argue is basically that the rule should be a combination of looking at the debt service ratio as well as the uncertainty and the uncertainty is proportional to that. So both the debt service ratio and that. This is a bit of a side remark, but I think that's, again, the analysis helps thinking about these issues. So let me move to the welfare cost of that. Let me look at the time and see that I'm not using too much of it. Okay, so this is a more complex issue. The traditional view, you know, if you ask economists, I think, uh, why debt is bad, basically they'll say, well, debt basically mortgages the future, right? If you have more debt, people are going to hold more debt in their portfolios hold less capital, but capital is a productive stuff. So if you hold more debt, less capital, then future output will be lower and uh, consumption will be lower in addition to distribution effects, which I'm not going to, to discuss. And so that is bad because it's also going to require an increase in future taxes and uh, uh, distribution effects and tax distortions. I, ju I just said I was not going to talk about this, but these are the two effects, lower cap, lower capital, lower output, and then distribution effects, future generations paying more than their share. Now, if you take a course in economics, uh, in your basically the growth theory, then you run into a result which was seen as very important conceptually, but not very important empirically, which is the golden rule result. Basically what Ned Phelps did uh, in about 50 years ago, 60 years ago now, he basically wrote down a simple growth model and he basically showed that in this growth model, if R was less than G, then this was an indication that there was something very wrong with the economy, that the economy was accumulating too much capital. And so given that it had to kind of replace depreciation and add to capital because of growth, uh, the marginal product was not covering that. So he said R minus, R minus G negative or R less than G uh, is actually very bad. And you can do better if you accumulate less capital. So you decrease investment and you increase consumption this period because you, some of what had gone into investment goes into consumption. Then you can in increase consumption later. Output will be lower, but consumption will be higher. And this was seen as, as a very important result, which it was. Then Peter Diamond basically said, okay, next step. Uh, I take that kind of growth model and I introduced public debt in the growth model, which Phelps didn't have, then public debt can actually increase welfare if R minus G is negative. And the reason is the same, which is people are going to hold more debt, therefore accumulate less capital. And that's going to be good because there was too much capital in the first place as reflecting by R minus G negative. So the result of this literature is that when you see a very low rate, it's an indication that there is a problem with the economy, in which case actually there might well be a, a room for that. It's too much saving, too little investment, or if you think the other way, insufficient private demand, which you know, too much saving is too little consumption. Uh, and therefore that can be useful. Now the big question, this was seen as an exotic result and very relevant, but not of direct relevance. But you, we are in a world in which R defined as the safe real rate 
uh, is lower than G. So what do we conclude? So this is what I worked on in my uh, presidential address. And I said, well, in the real world, there's uncertainty and there are many rates. So you have the safe rate, which is less than the growth rate. You have the average marginal product of capital, which is higher than the growth rate by quite a bit. So which one of the two? And, and I argued that actually there was an argument for thinking about the right rate as being the safe rate, which is quite striking. The reason is that I, we can think of a safe rate as the risk adjusted rate of return on capital. And the fact that the rate of return on capital on average is high is true. But what we care about is you know, the uncertainty of it. And therefore we want the uh, risk adjusted or the safe equivalent of that. And that's a safe rate. So this way of thinking said, well, maybe you know, the right rate is R, uh, uh, the, the, the rate on government bonds, and it's less than G, and we have too much capital. Then I basically went into various extensions and concluded it's more complicated than that. I think the basic conclusion, there's still a lot of research going on here. The basic conclusion is that we probably don't have a very accumulation of capital, but it may be that the marginal product of capital is not very high. So that in terms of debt, I think the conclusion is that may not be the catastrophe that uh, people think about. It doesn't mortgage the future in a big way. It is costly, probably at the margin, but the welfare cost may not be very large. So if you need to use it, I'm not saying you should use it, but if you need to use it for good reasons, then the welfare cost may be small. Okay, let me move to the, to the last of the three legs, which is the welfare benefits. Uh, of deficits. So that's, that comes from a completely different place, right? R minus G reflects the fundamental factors of the economy, but we have this strange thing, which is that the nominal rate uh, cannot really go negative. And therefore this puts uh, a, a constraint on how low the real rate can go. Uh, that depends on expected inflation. So one parallel discussion is whether we should have higher average inflation so as to be able to get the lower uh, uh, real rate on the zero lower bound, but I'll take this as given. So let me call the lowest rate that can be achieved by monetary policy our min. Uh, if it turns out that the neutral rate has to be less than our min, so our min is a number like minus 2%, but if a neutral rate has to be minus 3, minus 4%, which has happened fairly frequently in the past, monetary policy cannot do it. So the actual rate R is higher than the neutral rate and the monetary policy cannot do much. It can use QE, but it doesn't quite go all the way. So in this case, when you are really at the zero lower bound or you're close to it and you want to give a bit of margin to monetary policy, then fiscal policy has to do the job. If the economy is depressed, the monetary policy cannot sustain sufficient aggregate demand. So this leads to a whole other discussion about, well, does fiscal policy help move aggregate demand? How much do we believe in the multipliers, the effects of various fiscal measures on output? And here again in the book, I go into recent research and the result of the last 15 years, and in particular, I think what happened during the, the GFC is that we've done an enormous amount of work on multipliers. and. Basically, my conclusions, I, I state here, uh, there is no such thing as one multiplier. It depends enormously on expectations. When you see a decrease in taxes yourself, are they going to increase in the future? Or is this the beginning of low taxes for a long time? This will have completely different effects. Um, there was a case which was made uh, during the great financial crisis about so-called expansionary fiscal austerity. And this was the notion that if you had a government running large deficits and suddenly decreased deficits, so it was a fiscal uh, uh, contraction, fiscal austerity, then this would actually be good for aggregate demand because it would decrease the risks that people were perceiving, make them more relaxed. The spreads on sovereign bonds would collapse and this would actually increase demand. So Alberto Alicina was, was in that mode. I think it can happen, but today, you know, there are no spreads to start. So there's not much room to decrease spreads. I think there's much worry about uh, that unsustainability at this point. Um, the multipliers, uh, 
I find from the literature, basically have a right sign, which is if you decrease taxes, it increases demand. If you increase spending, it increases demand. There's one quite striking fact, which is, which is relevant, which is that we find, I think the literature finds that the multipliers from tax cuts are actually bigger than the multipliers from spending. Where well, the textbook would say it's the opposite because when you do a tax cut, you give it to consumers and they're only going to spend some of it. Where if you do direct increases in spending, it's one for one. The literature seems to converge on, on the opposite inequality and that has implications for the kind of package that you want to do. Okay, I have three slides left. Adam, I'm still basically on, on schedule more or less. You will follow the rules, you are on schedule. Okay, good. Uh, so I have three slides, two on putting things together and then one on uh, applications to some counterparts. So the essence of what I'm saying is that the lower our star, the smaller the fiscal and the welfare costs and the larger the potential benefits of debt and deficits. The complication is that our star is on the genius. It depends on the factors I've talked about, but it also depends on fiscal policy. So. I've been struggling for the best way of describing what optimal fiscal policy should do. I can do it in math, but yeah, I'm going to try to do it in words. And so I think the way to think about if you're not a policymaker, but a staff, staff member for a policymaker is this way, which is start with what is called the, the public or the pure public finance view of, of fiscal policy. So this is a view which says, let's ignore the effects of fiscal policy on output, on aggregate demand on output. Let's assume monetary policy will do the job. So we just, this is flexible price to use the, the lingo uh, uh, analysis. Now, in that context, you may still want to use that or reduce that. And so the thing we do is you say, is there, are there grounds for deficits or maybe surpluses? Uh, given some given R star, some given neutral rate. And you know, the list of things that we have to think about in this case is well known. The first one is tax moving. If you have a large increase in spending, but it's not going to last forever, then you may want to tax move rather than tax now. This will decrease distortions. So protection during COVID, refugees from the Ukraine war, uh, a bump in defense spending, a bump, not a permanent increase, but a bump. All this would lead you to want to issue some debt so as to distribute the uh, tax increases over time. Intergenerational redistribution for green investment. Do we have to pay for it or should we basically pass some of the costs uh, to future generations in the form of debt? The last one is, well, we may have as a result of decisions in the past, but that level may be much too high. We may basically be passing much too much of a burden to future generations, and we have to decrease it, right? And then it's a view of, of many people that that is too high and we should really reduce it on those grounds. And in each of these cases, uh, what I've said about R minus G becomes relevant. If R star minus G is small or negative, then tax moving is more attractive. In intergenerational redistribution is more attractive because the cost that you're passing on is smaller and the level of debt that you think is right uh, is also higher. So you can do that and then you come to the conclusion that this is what you should do. Once you've done this, and this is where things become a bit more complicated, is that as you take these measures and say you increase debt because you want to finance the war, then R star is going to increase. Or, you know, whatever you do, R star is going to adjust. So you have to find the equilibrium in which Given R star, this is what you do. And given what you do, this is what R star is. So conceptually, this is the first step. You just ignore macro in the aggregate demand short run sense and you do that. Okay, now if the result, so I have to go back to the previous slide, but I have this thing which stands in the way. Okay. So you do that and then Two things happen, you've solved, and you find that R star is fairly high. It's above the uh, lower, uh, lower bound, the real rate implied by the lower bound R min. So it's fine, it 
you know, you're not stuck there. And even better, it basically gives some margin for monetary policy to, to act. So for example, you do this computation, R min is minus 2%, you want, want to give two or 3% more room for monetary policy to act if demand is weaker for some time. So you basically, uh, minus two plus three, you basically find that R star is greater than 1%, you're fine. Basically you do what you said here and you stop. But if as a result of what you're doing or not doing, the R star which results is too low, is less than R min plus X, then you have to do something because basically you're in a situation in which monetary policy cannot do what you've assumed, which is to maintain output. So this is the second slide. So if the neutral rate is less than the lower uh, bound real rate plus this margin of maneuver X, then you have to basically change your plans. You have to run larger deficits uh, than would be implied by the pure public finance approach. And so you want to use fiscal policy to maintain output at potential because uh, monetary policy cannot do this at a rate which gives enough room to monetary policy in case it's needed. So you may want to run the economy at a rate, a real rate of say one or 2%. Okay. So that approach to fiscal policy, which is to say, well, output is really what we care about and monetary policy cannot do the job is known as a pure functional, uh, the functional finance approach. Uh, this was uh, 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 argued by many years ago by somebody called Abba Lerner. Uh, and that's, you know, an MT, I think is a caricature uh, of that view. Okay, now what's interesting is that, you know, we've talked about monetary policy puts. I think this leads you to think of a fiscal put, which is that basically you want fiscal policy to be such that R star is at least equal to R min plus X. Basically it's sufficiently large that you have potential output and monetary policy can play a role. Now, just to finish on this slide, now this is a very partial discussion of fiscal policy. There are all kinds of things that have to be put back. How do you think about public investment, for example, green spending? I think it tells you how to think about it, but I have not developed it. Um, there are cases where even if the uh, zero low bond is not relevant, uh, fiscal policy does a better job than monetary policy. Uh, automatic stability, uh, which are totally underused, uh, dominate monetary policy. And then fiscal and monetary policy have extremely different distributional effects. And given our attention in this stage uh, to inequality, this is a very relevant issue. Monetary policy increases inequality. It makes everybody better off, but by increasing asset prices, it makes some people even better off than the others. Fiscal policy has many more tools, can do a better job. Let me end with one slide which is the last part of the book says, okay, well, this is theory. Let's just think about applications. And so I look at three episodes. One I call too little, the other I call too much, and the third one I call just right. So too little is basically a review of fiscal austerity in Europe uh, in the wake of the financial crisis of so 2010, 2011. There was a total obsession with reducing debt at the time at which the zero law bound was binding and therefore that consolidation could not be offset by monetary policy. And I think that was a big mistake. I think most of the players today would agree that it was a big mistake. Too much is the current discussion, and that could be you know, a whole uh, hour on it, which is, I think, the Biden bet, which was a very large fiscal expansion. The idea was to increase output, increase our star, combined, and you know, whether this was strategy or accident, but basically with the Fed letting the actual interest rate be less than the neutral rate so as to basically overheat the economy and increase inflation. I think that was a bad bet and we're seeing the effects now. Uh, we have overheating, rates are going to be too high for some time. Uh, that I think is going to be costly. We may well have a recession. The one that I want to discuss a bit more is the just right. And just right uh, is a bit provocative it's looking at Japan, and many people would say it's a catastrophe. Uh, Japan basically has had a very low R star for decades, and it has fought it through, you know, keeping monetary policy as 
lose as possible negative nominal rates. But on the fiscal side, uh, high deficits and steadily increasing debt. So that now, you know, gross debt is around 250 and net debt is around 170% of GDP, which are very worrisome numbers. So what I argue in the book is that, well, they did the right thing, but there's a legacy, which is these very high debt levels. And then the question is, well, what if uh, our star doesn't remain very low, but increases or, or decreases? And let me just, again, be a bit provocative and say, well, maybe that's not the end of the world. So what if our star increases? And people say, well, if our star increases, they're having 250 growth. 1% uh, increase in, in, in our star is 2.5% of GDP. They cannot finance it, it's the end of the world. I think it depends very much on why our star increases. And that's what happens in other countries as well. The first one is a sudden stop, which is people say, oh, this debt level is crazy. They cannot pay it back or sustain it. And therefore they ask for a large spread, which justifies their fears. That's well known, that's a multiple equilibrium situation. I think in this case, the BOJ can avoid it. Um, it can basically go in, provide liquidity. If it's just pure speculation, uh, then I think it can avoid it. And uh, I don't think it's a big issue. Again, I think it has to do with the nature of the investors in Japan and so on, but I think it's doable. The second reason why our star might increase is that private demand, which has been fundamentally very weak in Japan for a long time, becomes much stronger and requires a higher rate to maintain uh, output and potential. Well, in this case, the problem basically solves itself, which is in that context, if private demand is too strong, then that's exactly the time when you can have fiscal consolidation and not pay an output price for it. So I think it's largely self-solving. The third case is, well, the world is such that the world R star increases. And then, yes, if you move with the world, R star will increase, that's an issue, but you don't have to and you can depreciate and remain basically with your lower own lower star. I worry much more, and that's the end, about the case where things get even worse and our star continues to remain very low, less than what the BOJ can achieve. And in this case, what happens is that, you know, the formula I've given is, well, run deficits to maintain demand, but there's probably a limit to it. And if the deficits are very large, Despite the fact that the rates are very low, the debt dynamics might be that debt keeps increasing. And so I think this raises the issue, if we came to a situation like this, do we have ways of sustaining demand uh, by other means than deficits? And my sense is yes, I think that social insurance can help, although there's not a whole lot of room for Japan to do more, but to the extent that a social insurance, there'll be less saving, which means less, uh, less less demand, and that has no implications for the budget. Uh, the, the, the other is uh, basically relying on public green investment, uh, hoping that there are very large uh, externalities and this leads to high private uh, green investment in such a way that basically this increases demand without having an effect on, on the deficit. But I think these are issues we may have to face, not just in Japan, but in the future. So with this, I shall stop. Thank you, Olivier. Uh, there are a lot of questions on the chat, but with our limited time, what I'd like to do is focus on some of the major critiques that are questions that have come up about your analysis. In particular, let's start with your last statement about the BOJ and what might happen if our star goes up in, say, in Japan. Uh, a number of people have suggested that you seem to be too sanguine about what might happen. Um, so, for example, when you say there's a sudden stop, potentially, uh, would the central bank then be able to handle it? I mean, we have seen sudden stops elsewhere, and they don't generally go well. Um, our colleagues, uh, what I call the the, uh, the addition, super odd couple or the odd trio of Orzag, Rubin, and Stiglitz a year ago published a paper with the Peterson Institute uh, 
suggesting that a jump in your framework, a jump in R, not R star, in R, uh, is potential is a very big risk and should be taken more into account. Can you expand a bit about why you are not as concerned as these people? Again, I go into the, the mechanics in the in the book, but it seems to me that if uh, if again it's a it's a multiple equilibrium in the sense that so many people were fine with the current dynamics, say, oh, no, no, the spread is very large, therefore the dynamics become worse, and therefore I'm, I'm right to, uh, to, to be worried. Uh, I think that the BOJ has the ability, if the first equilibrium still exists, to actually just go in and just say, we're going to maintain this rate, and we're going to basically be willing to intervene as much as needed uh, in order to maintain that rate. And so, to the extent that the first equilibrium seems to me to be uh, sustainable, then they can do it. They just it's just a question of committing to, to doing it. But but let so let me restate it then. And what is it that gives the BOJ that credibility of commitment? I mean, we're not we shouldn't talk about Greece in the crisis because of course they were monetary policy constraint. But what about Argentina or Turkey or Brazil? Why what, are you saying they could do what what Japan does, or what are the attributes that distinguish the ability? To it has to be that the good equilibrium is actually feasible, and I think in the case of Japan, it is. Uh, basically, they can stay where they are, have a very low rate, therefore, a low debt burden, and they can finance this, and that equilibrium exists. And so it's just a question of being willing to actually just make it happen. Uh, sometimes there's just no good equilibrium. The situation of a country, if you take Argentina or other countries, there is no such thing as a good equilibrium because even if markets were nice, it still is going nowhere. So I think what, what happens if you look at Japan is that the good equilibrium is actually feasible. And therefore, if it is feasible, then putting the, your money where your mouth is and being willing to say, we are willing basically to maintain a very low rate uh, is actually feasible. But it has to be that the underlying situation is such that there is a good equilibrium and it's feasible. And I just want to remind people that you and our former colleague Arvind Subramanian did a brief paper looking at its research and progress still to be done, but you did a brief paper, I guess, also about a year ago, looking at whether and when emerging markets have that access to that good equilibrium and when they don't. Um, so relatedly, you made some remarks about demography. And you spoke about the impact of demography on our star, I think was your main point. And you expressed that you don't see that changing very much over the coming years for the large, older economies. But usually in fiscal policy, when people talk about demography, it's to point out that um, dependency ratios are getting more and more upside down, that healthcare costs or entitlements of other kinds are going up, up, up. Um, is, is, is your calm about that because these things don't matter? Is it because markets will price this in properly? Is it something more to do with the distribution of who pays. Again, if you could just explain when people get very concerned about demographics effect on long-term fiscal balances, and you seem to say, I'm not worried about that. I was focusing on the effect of, of on, on saving. And basically when life expectancy increases, which is the dominant factor at this point uh, in the countries we're looking at, the age of retirement does not increase one for one, we increase in proportion, but not one for one. Then, you know, people will have to save more for the second part of their life. Uh, and therefore, the saving rate as a whole increase, right? Which yeah. tends to lead to, to a low, so a large supply of saving, which leads to a low equilibrium, uh, neutral, uh, neutral rate. That's the part I have in mind. Now, there are other aspects of getting older, uh, healthcare, various things like this, which 
you know, have other implications. But in terms of like, on saving, uh, when I look at, at the various effects, and it's, it seems to me, and, and with some computation, that the main effect, the main demographic uh, effect is basically the increase in expected life. And that tends to basically increase saving, therefore decrease the rate, equilibrium rate. Now there are many other aspects to demographics, right? But that's, but, yeah. you know, but you, your assessment of the literature is that is the dominant effect. Let, let me take it as that's an, not the assessment of the literature, but it's an assessment of models which try to take into account the, uh, the various effects. Oh, okay. So empirically, that remains to be established. Um, let me take it again in another direction that serious people have raised in terms of your arguments, which is more of a political economy direction. That, and this may be in part what relies on some of the resistance to the critiques of fiscal rules that you've addressed multiple times in Europe. Are there pe people will say, well, this is all fine and good in theory. And as you said, there are the working level technocrats who might be able to execute this. But in practice, this just gives this meaning your framework, just gives license to uh, politicians to spend, spend, spend whenever they want, and that'll get us into trouble. Or the, what you say tends to ease the emphasis, ease spending on public consumption rather than public investment. You take us away from talking about debt levels, but you don't really talk about returns on public spending. Can you address these kinds of concerns that you're giving an out for feckless politicians? Yeah, I mean, the, the starting point of this research is basically that I thought that the model belief of policymakers was uh, that that was very bad and we had to do something. In the course of my research, I decided it's more complex than then and it's probably not as bad as, as, as people thought because the interest rate is extremely low. Now, yes, I face danger on both sides, right? Uh, yeah, I, I worry that, you know, the, the risk is to say that is very bad and then you get policies which basically lead to recessions. Uh, and I think that, you know, if you read the part of the book on uh, on, on the discussion uh, during the great uh, the global financial crisis, uh, you see the degree to which the debt obsession stood in the way and led to decisions which probably made the recovery much weaker and much slower than, uh, than they would have been. So there is this risk. Uh, on the other side, yes, you have uh, the risk that people run with this and say Blanchard has shown that basically that is not an issue. So the question is, what do you do? Uh, I think if you're a politician, you may decide that, you know, you're going to basically just have a very simple message, even if it's not quite the right one conceptually, but this is going to achieve what you want. If you're a researcher, I think you want to say, this is what I believe and be worried about it being used one way or used the other way. And I think if you read my book, you'll see that it's very balanced. Uh, basically, I mean, if you look at the last two slides, the last three slides uh, that I presented today, I said basically do what's right from a pure public finance point of view, but realize that the cost of borrowing is not very high. So there are many things you may want to do, uh, which makes sense. Uh, and then if it's still the case that that's not enough to sustain demand, then do more. That's a balanced uh, message. Is it going to be misused? Uh, it may well be misused by people who want to misuse it one way, as the old one was misused the other way. So, you know, the question, the question is a more general one, which is when you're a researcher, but you're not indifferent uh, to the implications of what you say on, on, on the way policymakers think. I think you try to tell the truth and indicate where uh, in the middle it's reasonable to be, but that, that it's going to be misused one way or the other, uh, I think is always a risk. Thank you. We are out of time. There are many questions on the chat and a couple other questions I would like to ask you, but out of respect for our audience and our commitments, we will end it there. Uh, I am grateful to have had the privilege and the ongoing privilege 
as are all my colleagues, of having Olivier Blanchard be the Bergston Chair at the Peterson Institute and do this work fundamentally rethinking fiscal policy under low interest rates. As mentioned, the draft book, thanks to MIT Press, is available in various shorter materials, uh, including soon the this webcast and Olivier slides are available on the PIIE.com website. Thank you, Olivier, and congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, everybody.